our time of worship, some of you worship better seated. It's okay. When I say let's stand together, it's those people who normally stand and want to stand in worship. So if you're not led to, to stand in worship, don't worry. You listen to the Holy Spirit. What do I say? Don't listen to me. Listen to the Holy Spirit. If you're going to sit, sit in the Holy Spirit. Let him lead you to do that. But let's all stand. Those of us who stand in worship, let's stand together. You guys doing okay this morning? It got us, God got us here safely, right? Check. That's one. All right. Good fellowship so far? Oh, check. That's two. Very good. Let's see what the Lord does as far as worship this morning. Let's go to him right now. Father, we want to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit. And Lord, we are here to be in your presence and not the opposite. Father, we thank you so much that you're the one who guides, you're the one who directs, and we love you and we desire your presence, Lord, because of what it offers, but most importantly, because this relationship that we have with you. Father, again, I just praise you for what you're doing in our hearts and our lives. We commit this time to you, and Lord, we serve you as an audience of one. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Check. I've been playing with turn it on, turn it off. See, that's why you have private conversations, right? <laughs> to get the pastor right. <laughs> and, uh, he's just the sound guy. You're not on. It's very basic. Amen. We'll let the Holy Spirit do that. 
So think about God's presence in your life. I remember my wife had just mentioned this past week of a young man who um, was in the youth group that we were in about two years ago. And um, he, was, he was a bus kid. That means we bust him in. So he came in. And this one particular Wednesday night, they were having um, the, the youth choir, the, which was the entire youth, about 200 of them, sing to the congregation. This was a larger church that was shrinking, but the choir loft was something that most churches had. And we used to have one there. That's what the steps are for. And um, so he was sitting. He had ushered out with the rest of the youth. They sat in the choir loft. They were going to sing a couple songs to us. And so Jill and I were out in the congregation, and we were watching. And this, this young man was a little rough, you know, but so were we when we got saved, right? We'd been there. So all of a sudden, I see him. This is about 1,000 people in the congregation on Wednesday night. He, like, squinches down and acts like, you know, nobody can see him. Right? You can't see me. So he starts tipping out. And <laughs> I'm sitting there going, hey, bro, we can all see you. And you're not, like, sneaking. You're, we see, hey, we're right here. And he thought, you know, nobody could see him. 1,000 people. And he's just, like, dipping. I'm getting out. You're in our presence. We can see you. It's important for us to understand God can see us and what's he doing while you allow him into your presence. How important is the presence of God in your life? The Israelites were without Moses for about 40 days, and so they started getting restless. The Israelites will complain you know what I'm saying? They will complain. That's part of the definition. So anything not going right, the Israelites are going to complain. Who's it remind you of? <sighs> Me, right? Israelites, are, we, as for Moses, we don't know about this man, where he has gone. Build for us uh, gods to carry us from this point on. God's mediator wasn't there in the form of Moses. So Aaron listened to them. He made them a a golden calf later on, he said, you know, I just put it in the fire and it jumped out. There were no molds there, right? At least that's what he was saying. And uh, they sacrificed to the golden calf that particular day. And when they finished sacrificing, as was the custom, this was the general way that they, you know, sacrificed and worshiped. It says in verse 6, check verse 6, Exodus 32. It says this, right at the end of the verse, it says, the children of Israel sat down to eat, and then they did what? They rose up to, what's that word in your translation? A lot of the older translations say they rose up to play. So they sat down to eat, and they rose up to any other word other than pray. Anybody looking at their Bible this morning? 32, verse 6, right at the end, they sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to what? Indulge in revelry. That's a great word. So what, is, what do you think of when you think of revelry? Let's have a good old time, revelry, you know, a couple of drinks here and there. Any other translation instead of revelry? Pagan. To play. Pagan revelry. What translation do you have? That's good. Pagan revelry. What else? What do you have? I was Well... You were close. You got one of the numbers right. It happens to me. What do you got? Pagan practices. And the uh, NASB says this, lewd behavior. Okay, but as, you know, the Jewish word, what you got? Wild parties. What, what translation is that? Children's Bible. Children's Bible. See, hey, keep it straight, you know. We got to look at the, the translation. That is a good translation. We got one in the back, actually. If you want one, I can find one for you. Wild, what is it? Parties. Wild parties. Okay, wild parties. I get the impression from the Lord, and, and when you hear the conversation between Moses and the Lord, they really didn't want to talk about what was happening, and they're not like this in the rest of Scripture. The rest of Scripture, they're wide open. But it's as if, from my vantage point, Moses had a conversation with God, and he was like, this is so disgusting and embarrassing. I really don't want to talk about this public sin. The word lewd alludes to the fact that it was public and it was, it was not good. Well, the Lord had a certain reaction. Look at verse 7. The Lord said this. Then the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people whom you brought up. Let me read that again. 
the Lord said to Moses, go down because your people, so the Lord is speaking to Moses, whom you brought up out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf. They have bowed down to it, they've sacrificed to it, and have said, these are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses. They are stiff-necked, which which means obstinate, rebellious. Stiff-necked people. Now leave me alone so that my anger may burn against them and I may destroy them completely, is the thought there. And then I will make you into a great nation. I really like Moses' response. Listen as it continues to verse 11. But Moses sought the favor of the Lord, his God. Lord, he said, why should your anger burn against your people? Do you see the, you see the back and forth? Have you ever been in that situation where maybe you were the object of it, but your mom and dad are talking and they're like, you will not believe what your daughter just did. Right? And you're like, hold on a second. My daughter? Isn't she your daughter? Right? Have you ever heard that kind of conversation? And here you get the back and forth. Your, your Egyptians, or excuse me, your Israelites that you brought out of Egypt, the Lord is saying to Moses, and Moses is turning back and saying, hold on a second. They're your people, right? They're your people that you brought out. Why should your anger burn against your people whom you brought out of Egypt? With what? What is it? Great power and mighty, a mighty hand. Why should the Egyptians say... It was evil intent that he brought out, brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to wipe them off the face of the earth. Turn from your fierce anger, relent, that's a great word, and do not bring disaster on your people. Reason number two, remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, here it says Israel, to whom you swore um, by your own self, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and I will give your descendants all this land I promised them, and it will be their inheritance. Remember that. Verse 14 says what? Then the Lord relented and did not bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. A couple of things going on here. Moses, I like the way he says, hold on. And then to be honest with you, it's not that kind of situation. It's not like you won't believe what your son just did. It's more of a thing of honor that the Lord said, they're your people. And Moses back to him said as well too because look at who the children of Israel were and for God to choose them was an extremely honorable thing for God to do that God would actually choose these people and place his name on them in light of the fact he knew what they were going to do but Moses uses two two examples here he says number one why would you bring them out into the wilderness so that for the rest of the world they would see that you brought them out here to destroy them. Why? Number one, look at the testimony of the rest of the world in this process. But number two, you gave a promise, not to me, to raise up descendants for me, as many as are the stars in the sky and the sands on the seashore. But your promise was to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or in this case, Israel. It wasn't a promise to me. Remember your promise to them. So here we have Moses an individual who's deemed the mediator right now, standing between God's righteous wrath, God was right. He could have completely destroyed the children of Israel and standing and saying, listen, God, remember your mercy, that you are a God of mercy completely. Oh, I wish I had an advocate like that who could stand before God on my behalf and say, Lord, don't destroy him. Dave deserves it. Oh, wait a second. I do. What's his name? Sunday school answer? Very good. We do have an advocate like that. But God is not like asking questions, really. He knows the answer. He's drawing out of Moses what he wants the whole world to see. He wants the world to see the way that you and I are supposed to treat those that God has put in our midst. God is asking you this morning to be a Moses. Oh, but you say, but Lord, you don't know the people you've placed around me. He says, oh, yes, I do. Yes, they're oddballs, and yes, they're weirdlings, and yes, they're extremely worldly, and yes, you want to separate yourself from them, but look, I've called you to be an advocate for them. I sent you into the world to go out and to make disciples and to baptize. All power, the Lord said in Matthew 28, has been given unto me. He says, go, listen, I will be with you always, God says. 
God is asking us to be like Moses. Think of those that you have in your midst. Those who've stabbed you in the back. That's what they did to Moses. Those who, 40 days away, and let's go look for something else and someone else to lead us. There they are. And what does Moses do? Hold on, Lord. Have mercy on them. Remember, yes, you're 100% just and you are right if you destroy them. But I'm calling on your mercy. Have mercy on them. How many times have, have you as a parent cried out for God to show mercy on your children? Please, God, have mercy on my children. Have mercy. That's what he calls us to do in this world. That's what he's drawing out of Moses for us to be. So the story goes on. I'm not going to read the rest of it. It is sorted. <clears throat> Moses goes down, and the Lord has kind of told him what's going on. He said that they're sacrificing to this, but Moses goes down, and he sees with his eyes what's happening. <laughs> and He takes the Ten Commandments and destroys them on the ground, it's symbolic of the fact that they have broken the Ten Commandments, right? And then he takes the golden calf, grinds it into powder, throws it out onto the water, and asks them to drink it, symbolic of the fact that this is your sin. So then he says, who is on the Lord's side? All of the Levites run to Moses in the process, and he says, listen, I need you to go out and dispense judgment to those who deserve it. And I don't want you just to kill people who are deserving of this judgment that you don't know your relatives, your own children, judge them. The Levites all run to Moses. 3,000 people were killed on that particular day. So Moses, I think if Moses had really seen the sin that God was talking about when they were meeting on the mount together, I don't know that Moses necessarily would have spoke up because he got down there and he was like, oh, this is a mess. Let's start killing people. <clears throat> now listen, last week I was talking to somebody about the get-back coach. Remember what the get-back coach is on the sideline of a football game? They got a guy that's holding on to the head coach and they keep pulling him back so that he doesn't run into the ref or run out onto the field. He's the get-back coach. Anybody? Okay, thank you. Have you ever heard of comeback whoopings? When I was growing up and I was young, used to, I don't know if I saw this personally or I saw it in a movie, but parents would get so upset when they found out what their child did and their child would be crying in the room and they would come in and grab him by this arm and they would just start tearing him up. Just so you know, those were spankings. It wasn't abuse back in the day, just so you know, <laughs> right? And then they would give him a whoop and the child would be crying in the room and the parents would go off. Are you offended by this? No. No, oh, you're good. She's good. She's like, she's praying it would happen. It don't happen today, right? There you go. Not enough. We need more of it. Uh-oh. Calm down now. <laughs> so the parent goes off out of the room. The child's crying. You've already given whooping number one. And then the parent calms down for a little bit, and then the parent starts thinking about it again. Remember that? They start thinking. They get mad again. They come back in for second whoopings. I can't believe what you did. But wow, those are comeback whoopings. That's the second time. Had it happen, right? Yeah. Then you get whooped for crying too much on the front row. Remember that? Shut up before I give you something to cry about. Remember those? Remember that? So the Lord does what? He says to Moses at the end of chapter 32, he says, listen, I'm going to send a plague. Or he does. He sends a plague. And those that were not a part of the 3,000 that the Levites missed, he gave them a comeback whooping. And they died. We don't know the number of those. But in the process, Moses says, listen, if you have to kill somebody, let it be me. Once again, Moses stands in the gap and says, I'll be the mediator, I'll be the high priest, but take my life out. Incredible. That leads us to chapter 33. Verse 1 says this, Then the Lord said to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt. He's not stopping, is he? The Lord says to Moses, Leave this place, you and the people you brought up out of Egypt and go up to the land I promised and an oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So he's glad that Moses reminded him of the oath and the promise. That's what he wanted in the first place, saying, I will give you, I will give it to your descendants. Verse 2, I will send an angel before you and drive out the Canaanites, Ammonites, Hittites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey. But here's the key point. This is very important. But I will not go with you. 
because you are stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. When the people heard these distressing words, they began to mourn. Very good. Contrition. We see a brokenness. And no one put on his ornaments, for the Lord had said to Moses, tell the Israelites, you're stiff-necked, and if, you were to, if I were to go with you, even for a moment, I might destroy you in the way is the thought. Now take off your ornaments. So they were just being obedient, but they were genuinely mourning, and I will decide what to do with you. So the Israelites stripped off their ornaments at Mount Horeb. Now this next section describes something I believe I cannot justify it from any other illustrator, but I'm thinking to myself that this was a practice, what I'm about to read, that started here at this particular time. So what I'm going to describe, listen to this, verse 7. Now Moses used to take a tent and pitch it outside of the camp some distance away, calling it the tent of meeting. Anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside of the camp, and whenever Moses went out to the tent, all of the people rose and stood at the entrance of the tent, watching Moses until he entered the tent. As Moses went into the tent, the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses. Whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, they would stand, or they all stood and worshiped, each at the entrance of their own tent, and the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one who speaks to a friend. That's a standalone passage. The Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but as uh, his young assistant Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. And that was, I believe, simply because you have people that know that uh, at the end of this particular whole section here in chapter 34, we find out that Moses' face would glow because of the meeting that he would have with the Lord, so he would cover it up. And at some point, people would probably want to go to the tent and check it out and see, you know, is the Lord still in there? Maybe I could talk to him personally. You know, and Joshua was like, look, you don't need your face melted off here, like uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark, right? So Joshua would stand guard so that people wouldn't peek into the tent after the Lord had met with Moses. So I believe, and like I said, if, if you disagree, that's fine. I believe this practice happened for the first time here. Okay, and their reaction wasn't just, it said that they were worshiping at their own tents at the entrance as the Lord was walking through the camp. And in this particular instance, they were not just worshiping. What were they doing? They were mourning in the process. Mourning for what? For their sin. Now, I started by saying what? This is a complaining group of people, correct? They complain about everything. Give us meat. You know, they're complaining. Where's this Moses? Where's he been? Nobody complained about the people who were put to death. So how bad was the sin? Everybody was like, yeah, they probably should have died. That was messed up. I don't know. Did you see that? I'm glad they died. So the Lord also is justified by saying, my presence will not go with you. I'm going to send an angel with you instead. This was distressful to the people, and rightly so. But it also brought out in them what? They mourned. They didn't just worship God, so they're standing at the entrance of the camp. Here comes Moses. He's walking through. He's going to the tent of meeting. What's going to happen? What is going to take place? Verse 12, Moses speaks. And Moses said to the Lord, you've been telling me to lead this people, because he did. Verse 1, take these people out of the land, or take these people, go to the land that I promised. You've said, lead these people, but you have not let me know who you will send with me. You said some random angel. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways that I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is who? Your people. So they keep this banter back and forth. You're going to see throughout this whole story, the Lord calls them, Moses, they're your people. And Moses calls them, Lord, they're your people. And it's a badge of honor to represent God's people, even as corrupt as they are, even as disgusting as they are. It shows glory that God would actually choose them, knowing who they are in the process. So this isn't a derogatory thing going back and forth. But here he, he's, I think Moses is in a state where he wants to ask God a question, but have you ever been in the place where emotionally you can't even get the words out? You're so upset. 
And he says, here, you've been telling me to lead this people, but you haven't told me who you're going to send with me in the process. The Lord knows his real question. And look at what the Lord says in verse 14. The Lord replied, what does he say? My presence will go with you and I will give you rest. He recognized that Moses needed more than just his presence. He needed rest in the process. He recognized Moses didn't even know how to ask for it. There's no question here in Moses' statement. Moses just said, this is the situation. And the Lord says, I know what you need. I know what you need even without you asking it. And then listen to what Moses says, verse 15. And Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not send us up from here. How will, will anyone know that you are pleased with me or with your people unless you go with us? What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord responded to Moses a second time. What did he say? I will do the very thing you're asking. My presence will go with you. Even though he hasn't asked the question, once again, to this point, he's just made statements. But the Lord knows his heart. The Lord knows that he's genuinely asking the question, <laughs> who are you going to send? Some random angel? I need your presence. So he says a second time, I will do the very thing that you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. So here's the side piece. Moses gets rest and Moses gets reaffirmed that God has favor with him and God knows him by name. And God doubles down. He says, my presence will go with you. Twice he has said this. The Lord said, I will cause my goodness. Oh, wait, verse 18, very important. Then Moses said, now show me your glory. Show me your glory. Why does Moses ask for his glory? Again, you can disagree with me in this process, but I believe the story has not ended for good cause. We'll get to the end, and you'll see that it's the end, finally, when it is the end. But Moses says, show me your glory, as if to say, I need confirmation that your presence is really good. It's kind of like Gideon's fleece. He's saying, Lord, can you do something to confirm the fact that your presence will go with me? Show me your glory. Listen to what the Lord says. It goes on to say, um, you can't see my glory completely and live. Uh, and this, this is where it gets a little confusing because the Lord's already been meeting with him face to face, right? Lord's been meeting with him face to face. And now he says, show me your glory. So we know that there's different levels to the Lord's glory because at the end, Moses is coming out glowing. So he's getting some juice coming off of the Lord, right? He's getting some glow. But this is something else he's asking for. Now, a few weeks ago in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, we saw that all of entire um, the earth and all of the universe is going to melt away with a fervent heat. And in Revelations chapter 20, we find out that the elements, the earth, is going to melt away from the presence of the Lord in the process as well. So we know that the Lord's glory and all of his glory has incredible power. And here he says, you cannot see my face and live. I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock and I will hide as I go by. I'll put my hand out. That's an anthropomorphism. It's a, it's a human attribute given to God so that we can understand the story better. And anybody who knows the old songs, every time I, I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. Anybody know that song? He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. And our souls are weary, but here the Lord protects him. And then he says this in the older translations. He says, you will see my hindermost parts. All right, let's jump over to um, chapter 34 and verse 5. Verse 5, we get to see what he's talked about here. Then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with Moses and proclaimed to him as he walked by the Lord. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming the Lord. This is Yahweh, the I am that I am, the Lord, the merciful, the compassionate, the gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love, faithfulness, maintaining love to a thousand, and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Beautiful. So the Lord has doubled down and said twice, my presence will go with you. So who, who is it? Who's the Lord like? Well, I mean, what are his characteristics? The Lord doesn't show him all of his might and power. What does he show him? He shows him his compassion. He shows his, his mercy. 
His grace. Say it again. Abounding in love. Slow to anger. Woo, don't we need that? Slow to anger. Lord, please. Forgiving. Forgiving. What kind of sins does he forgive? All of them. What is it? All. Whether you might have rebellion or sin or, or wickedness. Covers every base. This is who's going to be in your presence, Moses. This is who you need. Moses is like, I need rest. I'm glad that you know me by name. I'm glad that I have favor. But when you walk in my presence, I need mercy. I need grace. I need forgiveness of all my sins, wickedness, evil, all the things that are in me. And the Lord says, this is who's going to go in your presence. End of story, right? We're done, right? We're not done, are we? Mike knows we're not done. Look at what Moses does. Verse 8, Moses bows to the ground at once and worships after the glory of the Lord walks by. And then Moses says this, Lord, he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, then let the Lord go with us. You, you, you sense a little bit of redundancy here? How many times has he been asking for the Lord's presence to go with him? He asks him again. Then he said, if I have found favor in your eyes, let the Lord go with us. Although this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our wickedness and our sin and take us as your inheritance, but let the Lord go with us. <laughs> Once again, he's asked. He hasn't really asked. He's made a statement, but the Lord knew he was asking. Him. The Lord said, I'm going to go with you. I'll give you rest. The Lord said, I'm going to go with you, and I'm going to bring with, me, with you my compassion my forgiveness, my love, my grace. And Moses asks again, if you please send your presence with us. And what does the Lord say? Then the Lord said, I am making a covenant with you before your people and I will do wonders never done in any nation in all the world. And the people you live among will see how awesome is the work that I, the Lord, will do for you. He kept asking and he kept receiving. He kept knocking and the Lord said, I got more, I got more, I got more. He knew God's character. I need, how many of you would like a nap after church and you have a nice meal? Come on now. I need a nap. You want one now? <laughs> Come on now, Jimmy. I'm still, we got time to go here. Later, later, right. Uh, rest. And then the Lord says, listen. And in some translation, he said, he said listen, I am going to go with you. I know you by name. You have found favor in my sight. I'm going to come with you with all of my compassion. That should be enough, right? mm, -mm. I'm going to do miracles and wonders like no nation has ever seen before. He kept asking. Let me ask you a question this morning. How important is the Lord's presence in your life? Very important. Why? He not only brings rest. He not only brings forgiveness. He brings miraculous things into your life that you had no idea that he was going to do. And Moses kept asking and asking and asking. I don't know about you. Anybody else other than rest need a little miracle in your life? Can I get a witness? I need wonders. I need things to change. I need people to change. Okay, I'm going to be honest with you. I have studied this. My wife knows. I've studied this for years. I've never preached it this way. Ever. It's time for miracles, isn't it? It is time for wonders. It is time for the Lord. To sh Something happened months ago, and uh, I started praying. And as I started praying, I prayed for all these different things. And the more I prayed and the more hours spent in prayer and the more time spent in the sanctuary praying, the Lord kept telling me, stop asking for stuff. Just ask for me and my presence. You know why he was saying that? So for the last three months, all I've been doing is saying, Lord, I want you to be in a place where you're loved and where you're wanted, where you're desired. I want you to feel comfortable in my presence first. 
and in this church as well. I want people to walk in and sense your spirit and to know the Lord is in this place. Undoubtedly, he's in this place. He's here. His presence is here. Don't ask me for anything. Ask me for my presence. And why was he leading me that way? Because that's all I need. When I get his presence, I get everything else. Everything else. Rest, compassion, wonders, power. I can trust him. I just need his presence. Let me just tell you, he gets in your stuff too. He get, once you start asking for him to be in your presence, it's like, oh my goodness, Jesus is here. I'm watching this show this weekend. I'm like, this is okay, a little blood and gore. Blood and gore is in the Bible, right? No problem, right? And then all of a sudden in episode five, she says something. I'm using VidAngel. VidAngel is supposed to take out all the dirtiness. She says something so dirty. I'm like, oh, I'm sitting next to Jesus. We cannot watch that. <laughs> That's embarrassing. Jesus, close your ears. I had to turn it off. I really wanted to watch the show. It's got everything in it that I like. It's so good. But I'm sitting next to Jesus. Hey, we've been talking about a men's group. We're driving along, right? Right? Oh, Jordan's trying. Where's Jordan at? There you go. Jordan trying to get you to sin. All right? Your hands up. They have the best relations. I'm t- Look at him sneaking out. Hey, Jordan, we can see you, bro. That's right. God says, when, when you got my presence, you got everything you need. He was just pulling it out of Moses and pulling it out. I'm ready for the miracles. I'm ready for the miracles. I'm ready for the good. I have not been able in months to pray for you guys, for you physically, financially, because the Lord has been saying, just pray for my presence. And now I know why. In the evening, though, I told you last week, I started listening to this guy, Revivalist Sam. Remember? Ethereal music. Uh, Touch. Touch. I'm telling you, I love this guy. He's on TikTok. Revivalist Sam. Four o'clock, he's live, so I'm listening to him. And all of a sudden, as I'm, he's praying for miracles. He's praying for healing. He's praying for breakthroughs. He's praying for restoration. People are calling in, and all of a sudden, I start thinking about you guys. I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about the miracles that need to be done. And it's like the Lord said, just believe. Just trust in me and start bringing them before me. And the names start coming. Lord, help this person. Help this. Lord, please intervene. Lord, please intervene. He is a God of miracles. And he asks us to be it as unto you as according to your faith. Your faith has made you whole. Trust and believe in him. But all he's asking us to do is make our presence a habitable place for his presence to be. Let's all stand together this morning. Maybe you're here this morning, and um, I haven't specifically spoke about Christ, the mediator who took our punishment for us. We see that a little bit in what Moses did. But if you're here today and you don't know Christ as Savior and Lord, today can be the day of salvation. Today can be the day where you turn to him and say, Lord, I, I need forgiveness for my sin. I need to make you the Lord of my life, and I want your presence in my life. All you have to do is tell him. He understands contrition. He knows what we're saying even when we don't have the ability to ask the question. He knows our heart. And we can turn to him and say, Lord, I need forgiveness. And we, like the Israelites, can say, we're his people. He places his Holy Spirit inside of us when we turn to him. And he transforms us and he gives us his presence. And he, what does he vow? I will never leave you nor forsake you. Isn't that a great promise? So if you're here today, you don't know him as Savior and Lord, turn to him and just tell him, Lord, I need you as Savior in my life. And he receives you because of the blood of Jesus Christ. We look at what was last week's message, fixing our eyes on the author, the author, finisher 
of our faith. He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He begins this pro- He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. That's who he is. All we need is his presence this morning. All we need is his presence. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for your goodness. We thank you, Lord. You know our needs. Even when we don't have the ability to ask for our needs, Father, you're right there. And you draw out of us, Lord, our needs so that we can know you. Father, I pray not just for rest, and not just for forgiveness and compassion and grace and mercy, but Lord, over our congregation and over this ministry and over each one individually, Lord, I pray your amazing works and your miracles for them and your wonders, Lord. That people undeniably would have to say, Jesus did that in their life. I know it's Jesus. Father, I pray for that for people today. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you curse me, then I will bless you. If you hurt me, I will forgive. And if you hate me, Then I will love you. I choose the Jesus way. If you're helpless, I will defend you. If you're burdened, I'll share the weight. And if you're hopeless, then i be show you there's hope in the Jesus way. I follow Jesus, I follow Jesus. He wore my sin, I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure, he is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. And if you strike me, I will embrace you. And if you chain me, I'll sing his praise. And if you kill me, my home is heaven. For I choose the Jesus way. I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. He wore my sin. I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. I choose surrender. I choose to love. Oh, God, my Savior, you'll always be enough. I choose forgiveness. I choose grace. I choose to worship no matter what I face. Choose the Jesus way. I 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 follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. He wore my sin now. Gladly wear his name. He is the treasure. He is the answer. Oh, I choose the Jesus way. I follow Jesus. I follow Jesus. He wore my sin. I'll gladly wear his name. He is the treasure, he is the answer, 
Lord, so much for being present with us this morning as we worship you. And as we leave your house today, let us choose to remember you in our presence in every moment of our day and in our week. Thank you so much, Jesus. We ask this in your name. Amen. Thank you all so much for joining us for worship. We do have Wednesday night is uh, the last Bible study, I believe. For the ladies. For the Oh, come behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. Oh, mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, with us in the storm. And you will lead us through the fiercest battle, oh, where else would we go with the Lord of Jacob, fierce and great, you lift your voice to speak. The earth that bows and all the mountains move into the sea. Oh Lord, you know the hearts of men and still you let them live. Oh God, who makes the mountains melt, come wrestle us and win.
every battle we face, you are with us. Thank you, Jesus.
morning. Please speak through our pastor as he delivers your message of hope and peace to us all. We ask this in your name. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> 